Senator Olympia Snow is a political throwback, a New England Republican who not only made friends in Congress, but met her husband there. Now, after 18 years, she's fed up with the dysfunction and stepping down. Congressional reporter Ed O'Keefe asks her why in another in our series of exit interviews. Well, Senator, thank you for doing this. Remind us, why leave? Why, why, why try to, you know, why not stay and fight? Well, I am a fighter by, you know, by nature. Uh, I wouldn't have been in the political arena as long as I've been, which is 40 years in the legislative branch. But uh, something's fundamentally changed in the United States Senate um, that I had not previously experienced uh, in my legislative life, and that is they're not solving problems, which is the essence of public service. I mean, here we are in the midst of a fiscal cliff, to prove my point, you know, we may get there with a solution, uh, albeit temporary, but again, it was manufactured and created by Congress and the President uh, to avoid dealing with the real issues in, the real, in real time. You met your now husband, John, while right. both of you were serving as Maine's two congressmen. Um, I'm curious whether you think uh, such a relationship that, uh, would be possible in today's Congress, considering the the lack of privacy, the speed at which this place works, the fact that everyone wants to leave town on Fridays as soon as possible. <laughs> would, would, would two members of Congress ever be able to date and marry <laughs> in this environment? Well, I guess two others did. And, uh, Connie well, Mack and Mary Bowen right. said they did it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hectic life. I don't know. You'd have to manage it. That's true. I felt like my life was hectic back then, but um, it's, it would certainly be hectic today, given you know how fast-paced the environment it is, and with the technology and you know the the demands that are around the clock. And my, my husband and I were both on the ticket together for re-election right. in 1990. I was in the House and he was serving as governor, and that was highly unusual to have us both on the top of the ticket. Uh, you know, running for re-election. It's not something I would recommend to people. <laughs> where, where, where does the Republican Party go now? And, and more specifically, in your case, how can the Republican Party somehow become dominant and influential again in New England and in the Northeast? I think it's uh, we're going to have to really, you know, re-examine, um, first of all, exactly what went wrong in the last election. Uh, secondly, is that the party really has to uh, rebuild, you know, I think, its positions on issues and to demonstrate more inclusiveness and tolerance, um, moving away from the social issues, but focus on the things that matter, you know, to the, you know, not only to the broader population of Republicans, but to the broader population overall in this country. Mm -hmm. Focus on the real issues that matter and speak to that. I mean, there are so many issues that we could have focused on in this last election regarding like the economy. Well, and the whole issue of the, the small business thing, I would have, you know, frankly, we should have been arguing long before now about the question of why we're not ha we didn't have tax reform, why we didn't have regulatory reform. Those were the underpinnings, frankly, of, you know, of, of, for a recovering economy. The bells are tolling, and I know you've got to go to a vote, um, such mm -hmm. as life in the Senate. Mm -hmm. I know you're working on a book that is due out at some point mm -hmm. next year that sort of summarizes all these frustrations, yes. right? I think uh, you know, compromise has been mistaken for somehow capitulation of your mm -hmm. principles. It isn't that at all. You know, it's understanding, you know, what the differences are and how you can bridge those differences. America is on a threshold, is at a threshold moment here. You know, it's, I describe it as a tipping point. It's not any moment, it's a tipping point. And we have to make some profound and transformational decisions about the future of our country. What specifically can they do besides picking up the phone and Calling yeah, the email, office or watching, right. watching C-SPAN. Exactly, and communicating that. Uh, so you said there's not to, enough of that going on. No, I think that there is not. And people ask me all the time, not only in my state, but all across the country, in response to the position that, you know, I've taken and the decision that I had to make. And they ask me, well, what can we do? And I think one of the most important things they can do is to become involved through the social media, just as Occupy Wall Street did, just as Tea Party did. So can other people, you know, that middle, probably more than 60% of the American people who want the process to work. They want the system to work. I've had people say, make a decision, any decision. They're just worried that Congress doesn't have the capacity to make any decisions at all. We're not even engaged in the routine business. We can't pass budgets. 
I mean, we've got to get back to order and discipline in terms of the way in which we work here in, within the institution, but doing the nation's business. Well, the bells are mm -hmm. tolling. You have to go for one of your final votes, yes. but we appreciate you well, taking the time. Thank and you. And congratulations and you. good luck in retirement. I know it sounds like you're going to be uh, around, so we'll yes, probably exactly. see Yes, <laughs> exactly. Right. I plan to be. Well, thank you, thank Senator. Thank you. Thank you.